Alrighty, guys. Well, welcome back to second episode of Self-Selecting Podcast. Uh, I think we're going to go with that name. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how I feel in a month. Um, I'm going to try to stick with it, though. I kind of landed on this name because I do think a large majority of the clients that I get, a lot of the people that come across my desk, in some capacity or another, they very much are individuals who are choosing to take matters into their own hands, whether that be they want to educate themselves, they want to understand what they're doing, why they're doing it. Um, some of them are even coaches themselves and they, they want to become better coaches, which to me is like unfathomable. The idea that there are coaches coming to me for advice like that, that's just, it's wild. Um, and I don't know, like you think like, okay, autonomy, autonomy is something that is super important to me, like as an individual, I think, uh, when we start considering, okay, an individual who is looking to make changes, a big, big part of motivation really is going to come down to seeing that buy-in. And I think for a lot of people, they want to force this. They want to, like as a coach, uh, I guess in this setting, they want to force someone to see the value. They're going to be like, but I told them, I told them that this is the way it's done. Yeah. But like, you didn't convince them. Like, it's not enough. You didn't sell them enough. They don't see the value. And I get questions like these all the time from people, uh, who are, who are looking to make changes even, even for themselves. I don't know why I can't, uh, change this pattern or behavior. And even in that regards, I do think that it strongly, strongly is related to your ability to determine the value. I think when you want to change, you will change. When you decide that the consequences, the negatives, whatever the outcomes are that are no longer serving you, uh, if I want to sound super cliche, when you decide that yeah, this, this isn't the best way. And I'm going to find another way to do it. Even if the next way that I try is not the best way, I'm still going to try. Um, I think it's hard, hard to instill this, but one of the best ways that I've found to help clients or even, I guess, even with myself is really allowing myself to choose, to choose to make that change. It's not forced. It's not conditional. Like when, whenever we're talking about, um, whenever we're talking about adherence, you know, you got to think, okay, well, non-adherence, it's either creative. So maybe it's done unintentionally. So creative non-adherence, like you're finding ways to slip in a little extra food, um, Maybe it's, maybe it's unintentional non-adherence where like, you don't even realize it. You don't even realize that like oils and butters have extra calories. Maybe you realize it, but you're like, it can't be that much. It's negligible. Well, yeah, yeah, probably until it isn't until you do enough things that ultimately add up. And maybe these things, maybe you get away with it for majority of the time, but then you put yourself in a position where you, you gotta like, you gotta take a fine tooth comb, uh, to the bottlenecks. I don't think that's the right word or the word I want to use. You got to take a comb to this and, and really separate. Okay. Like what is impeding progress? And what I find is that from a food reporting standpoint, the more consistent someone can be with the negligible calories. Well, as long as this amount, this volume isn't consistently increasing, as long as it's relatively the same, it's auto-regulated, um, it's intuitive. Well, then we, we shouldn't see a problem even trying to get to very, very low body fat levels. <clears throat> this becomes a problem. However, if over time that volume of that slush fund of calories that aren't getting tracked, it becomes a problem when this increases. And I think, uh, 
I, I see this a lot with individuals who struggle with hunger or who, I guess, like utilize food as a coping, a means of coping, uh, which has been me at several points throughout my bodybuilding journey. Several points have I leaned into food in some, uh, in some, some degree of leaning into it or not, but I don't know. I think, I, I think when you're getting someone to, to be honest about how accurate they are in their food reporting, I think they have to first recognize that like, Hey, this is the problem. And I think that can be really hard for some people to do because accepting control over something that is very challenging and that they might not have the wherewithal to, I guess, I guess withstand, um, can be very upsetting. It can be very upsetting to be told like you are the reason that you're not seeing progress despite the effort that you feel like you're putting in. You are putting in efforts in several places, but the place where it really needs to go, you're not putting in enough. That's hard. That's hard. It doesn't just apply to bodybuilding. That applies to relationships. You ever, <laughs> maybe, maybe y'all will follow me on this. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, you ever date someone or you're with someone who like your love language is different than how they show love. I'm sure there's a term for that, but uh, for simplicity, like your love language is, I don't know, like positive affirmations. And uh, let's just say like kind words, like just generally like affirmations, reassurance, good communication. And then how they show love is like giving gifts or acts of service. And you're like, yo, I'm fucking independent. Like I can do my own shit. My time management is so good, dude. Like I don't need you to do X, Y, and Z. Like it, it's nice. It saves me time. Yes. And I appreciate it, but doesn't really mean the same thing if I'm not getting that adequate communication. And of course that's ambiguous, but tying this back, tying this back to my bodybuilding example, uh, whenever whenever someone is uh, allocating their resources, their energy, their efforts to different points, parts of their program, it's really important. And this is going to be like a common theme. This is going to be something I probably talk about every episode, every talk, is there are things that are weighted heavier. There are things that account for more or most of your progress. Number one, adherence. Adherence to the fucking calories that are written on your plan. Not the calories that you think you're eating, not the calories you're tracking in my fitness pal or chronometer. The calories that are actually written on your plan. Can you adhere to those? If it says 1400, if you track 1400, but you really like eat like 16 or 1800, that's not adherent. That is close to adherent. Now, when you start to consider, okay, well, what are, what are the other, what's the other big contributor? Um, I mean, like I, the, I'm split because like, I think when it comes to fat loss, it, it is the cardio. Um, but that's assuming that there's like a minimum threshold with training that is like a, a minimum intensity that is being met with training because I've seen different levels of training and I can like. I can think, I can recall individuals who I'm like, oh, this is the problem. Like you're calling this weightlifting, but in actuality, what you're doing, you're, you're just burning calories here. Like this is a, this is not a good, good, um, in essence, like you're not really putting your muscles under any kind of mechanical tension. You're really just exhausting yourself. You're tiring yourself out. So with that assumption that like weightlifting is least is at least at that like minimum threshold, well, then I would say like relative to fat loss. Yeah. Cardio, cardio is the second biggest thing. Um, adhering to a consistent amount of cardio. So what I like to do and what I do for clients is I give them a weekly total. And the reason being this kind of ties back into autonomy is I, I don't think 
that a lot of people are are aware or self-aware enough to recognize the stress that comes with, um, I need to do 35 minutes a day, five days a week, five days in a row. Okay. Well, how many rest days can I have in between? Well, like, yeah, this is simple from a, should be pretty simple from a time management standpoint, but, uh, particularly for individuals who are very busy, who have kids, who have, uh, you know, who work full time, who, who are, who are not just fitnessing full time. The drop off in fatigue to be able to just be like, yo, I'm going to plug this in as I go. I'm going to plug and play because that is what's going to work best with my schedule. And if they want to do like, okay, 35, they want to do it consistently across the board, constant, cool, that's fine. But I personally find this is a lot, a lot easier in the sense if you do miss a day, well, now you're not having to double up or I don't know if you're doing seven days, I guess. Uh, if you do miss a day and cardio is really high, now you're not like, well, nope, I just missed a day. There was no way I could make it up. It's like it does actually require then the client to have some foresight in planning their cardio, planning it out. Um, I think another benefit of doing it this way, the weekly cardio, is that if you're really struggling, like if you are just fucking lit up and you would plan to do a lot of cardio, but you're like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to save the energy. I'm going to reserve this chaos for my lift. Dude, I, I want you to do that 10 out of 10 times. Like I want you to do the cardio too, but like if we're talking about opportunity cost, if doing the cardio is then going to take away from your lift, I don't want you to do that. I would rather you lift. I'd rather you lift and lift hard, hit that intensity correctly. Like you should be doing regardless every time. Uh, and if that means that you just have to like reallocate that amount of cardio for that day or some of it even, like maybe just fucking go in and do like 15 minutes and then save the other whatever, 30 minutes or other additional 15, whatever it is, just put that, plug it into a different day. And it's pretty reasonable. And then like to me, that's not a big ask than to do like cardio seven days a week, assuming you're not doing like an hour each day. I think at that point we can be like, okay, you're going to the gym, do five minutes before your training session, do 10 minutes post training. Like this is not a hard thing to do um, from a mental acuity standpoint, like from a, I guess a mental fatigue standpoint, not acuity. Uh, but I would also say, would also say another, another big benefit is then if something happens and you don't make it to the gym, like kids get sick, you can't go, I don't know, you get let out of work late, um, gym closes down. I don't know. You're in Texas and it like is raining too hard and you can't go cause it's flooded. Uh, well you're fine. You're fine then because you're like, yeah, well, assuming it's open tomorrow, which I'm sure it will be, I can just plug in that cardio elsewhere. So yeah, like really you got the nutrition component, you got the dietary adherence, you got the food reporting, then you got the cardio part of it. Sure. Two of the bigger bigger driving factors that are going to contribute to an accurate rate of loss, uh, an accurate creation of your deficit. Now past this, past this um, kind of, I don't know, stemming back to the original analogy I had, you have people who aren't as consistent with the food reporting. They're not as consistent, even with the weekly cardio. They're like, oh yeah, I, I swapped out like elliptical, even though normally I do stairs and it's like, <clears throat> not the same thing, not the same calorie burn. Uh, and then we consider, okay, like heart rate too. Heart rate's another one. Like I, I give people like a target range, but I gotta be honest, like when I initially started doing it this way, I was like 140, 150 even, which is a little excessive. That's a little high, probably too high. But I was also like, I can scale it back or I can scale some of it back as I get leaner, which I ended up doing. Ultimately, though, I think striving for this, like, oh, I need to be between 120, 130. Like, yeah, like it's it's a good idea. But I think people also then tend to convince themselves that like, oh, I hit 120 when I'm out like walking my dog or when I'm like, you know, on the spin bike on my phone. Like, you don't. I promise you, you don't. 120, 130 beats per minute. Uh, this is 
for the clients who um, not iPhone users don't have like a Samsung Galaxy like little watch thing. Uh, I mean, I, I always recommend getting the Wise app, which is like 35, 38 bucks because it tracks your steps and I think it tracks your heart rate too. But a, a good a good litmus for for um, heart rate. Can you keep up a conversation? Because I I I am not very cardiovascular cardiovascularly sound. In case you tuned into my webinar Friday, I was like rapid firing those answers, and honestly, I've like heard a clip of myself. I was like, Jesus Christ, you sound like you sound like a French bulldog girl. Like you're out of breath. Um, I am doing cardio again now because I am in a fat loss phase. I actually did didn't do my cardio already today. Uh, anyways, uh, irrelevant, not needed at all for this context. If you are able to hold a conversation around the, uh, like, a, like you're able to talk with a friend and you're not finding yourself actually getting out of breath, you're probably heart rate is probably not high enough. We should see generally, we should see at 120, give or take, it should be difficult to continue to have that conversation. It's not, not always the case. Some people, like maybe you have a deviated septum like I do. Uh, maybe you just you breathe fucking funny. You have a lot of words per minute. I don't know. But there's a lot of ways that people get these fundamental things wrong. And ultimately, I think if we're not going to be honest as coaches about this, well, it makes it hard. It makes it hard because then... In some cases, you have clients that are chasing this very nuanced correction, this intervention that's surrounding like supplementation, um, even I mean, fuck like, oh yeah, I think, I think my hormones are, I think my hormones are out of range. I think they're imbalanced. Well, like, let me tell you this, even if they are imbalanced, even if they are, you can still lose weight. A deficit still works even with suboptimal hormones. Uh, even with TSH high, even hypoactive thyroid like function, I'm telling you, you still lose weight. Even with PCOS, you still lose weight. And hey, your test should be higher. So you're actually at an advantage in some ways. But all that being said, we got to approach this better. We have to approach it in a sense. Okay. Like uh, Maslow's like, okay. Hierarchy of needs. Are you doing the things that move the needle the most? Are you reporting food accurately? And if you're not, if there's any discrepancy in food reporting, okay, let's clean it up. Um, this kind of ties into cheat meals. Cheat meals, which like I'll talk about just for a brief, brief moment because I, I think it is relevant to this conversation. When we consider the impact of cheat meals and what they can do, the potential uh, deviance, uh, addition of calories. Like the idea that people have with cheat meals, I mean, like, I, I don't like the whole, oh, like, why do you need to cheat if you're diet? Like, I get it. Okay. Some people, some people need the mental break. That's okay. I'm okay with the mental break. I support the mental break. What I don't support is the justification of a binge or the justification of needing it versus just saying, I want it. Like, I want it. I want to go out to dinner with my husband and have a glass of wine. Corey, that's what I'd like to do. Or I would like to, I don't know, I want to order a dessert. You know, I want to eat my, my normal meal and plan, but I want to get a really bomb dessert. Can I do that? Um, there's a lot of ways that you can fuck up with the cheat meals and it can actually take you out of the deficit. And I think a lot of people, like this was me for a long time. Like I, I underestimated the calories in cheat meals for so long and it put me in a position where I'd be dieting all week. I'd be like in a deficit, like for sure in a deficit. And then I would do one meal. But of course it wasn't just like a normal meal. It was like appetizers, entree, definitely dessert. I'm a dessert girl. Well, okay, dude, 
Your entree was a thousand calories. Your appetizer was 700. Your dessert was a thousand calories. You split that even between two people. Like that is so, so much higher than where you should be. And I mean, like, I know I'm, I'm over, I'm overemphasizing that even if like we were to go more like, I don't know, like 60, 40, 70, 30, which is reasonable. It's probably what I should do, um, relative to someone much bigger than me, assuming I'm going out with someone much bigger than me. Uh, yeah, like it's still a thousand calories, like easy. Well, well, okay. How much of a deficit were you in? Were you in a 500 calorie deficit? Because if you were and everything else was reported, and then you had an additional, let's just say, 1,000 calories. Now you're in a 500-calorie surplus, which isn't that bad if it's just 1,000 calories. But how do we know it's just 1,000 calories? How can we guarantee that? Well, we don't. We don't know. Now, let's say we go more like 50-50. Okay, well, now it's closer to 1,000 calories over. Now we have to really consider, okay, well, that's like almost a third of a pound, give or take, maybe a quarter of a pound, close, right? So mm, that's not great because if you're only losing, like if your goal is to lose one pound a week and the goal is like, let's like aim for a 500 calorie deficit, if you're short of that, okay, well, I'm assuming you are not actually in a 500 calorie deficit. Maybe you're in like a 300 calorie deficit. So in turn, now you're overage or surplus is is greater yes um but now the following week there will be some hindrance or dare i say impedance in your rate of loss would you look at that i wonder how that happened and that's if you just went like with the simple like three course meal and you were like hey babe like you go ahead and have more i don't need as much as you which like not to flex, but like, like I, I've always, I don't know. I've always, it's a, it's the way I was raised guys. Like my fucking dad, like I blame him entirely. He, I mean, it's a little fucked up. He would like, he would really actually like encourage me to eat. And I, I get where it comes from. Like that was something that he valued himself, like growing up, like being able to provide food on the table. Uh, so like as much as I might be like, damn, not like maybe kind of disordered like I have my ghrelin uh, my hunger signaling is also fucked growing up um, it came I want to think from a good place but typically whenever whenever we'd go out it was like it was very much emphasized like eat as much as you can uh, not healthy N- definitely not healthy definitely screwed up my view of how much I need from an energy standpoint. Um, not that uncommon though. I hear, I hear this from a lot of, a lot of women, a lot of women my size too. So when you think about it, you're like, okay, that's, if you're still showing discipline, even though you're getting the three course meal, but you're still like moderate in what you consume, like, well, now you've just impacted the following week. And if you were only losing a quarter of a pound, you may have well just created a wash for that that next week maybe you didn't lose any weight then you go to your coach you're like oh well i think it may have been the cheat meal but you know what you know what people don't say people usually don't say i think i overdid the cheat meal i think i went too hard i understand it It takes a lot of balls it takes huge balls to tell your coach yeah i fucked up like i i win I went harder than I thought I did. Um, I didn't even go that hard, but I think the calories, I think it still um, comes out to a much, much higher net, net total, I guess, gross calories for the meal. That would be my advice. That would be my advice. If you are working with a coach and you have cheat meals on your plan and you overdo it, tell them, tell them immediately, own it. And you know what you should should really do? Should work with them on strategies to prevent it from continuing to happen. Because if it happened once accidentally, hey, like, okay, cool. Um, assume it could happen again. You don't have to like this. It doesn't have to be a thing. It doesn't have to be like something that you stress over. Um, but I would definitely voice, like if it were me, um, 
I would be like, hey, this is my plan next cheat meal to not let that happen again. Because I don't want to feel the way that I felt this week when you gave me a cheat meal. I realized, fuck, I, I went, went a little too hard. Like maybe I should order food that is um, less calorically ambiguous. Maybe I should pick something that probably doesn't have hidden calories. Listen, it's like, it's discouraging. I know. I know. Especially for you guys like me who you fucking like. You like bad food. You like food with calories. I like food with calories. I do. I'm not one of those people who's like, yeah, I don't eat. I could just not eat. I'm so great at just, no, no, I just air. That's all I need. Air and water. No, I fucking love food. I love calorically dense food. I'm from the South and like I grew up on just topping your calories with more calories. It's okay. This is something that is okay to admit. This is not going body positive, I promise you, but it is also important that you recognize like, hey, if that's your tendency, don't, don't try to deny that. Like own it, own it, get to the point where you're just like, ah, yeah, I, I tend to overindulge. I'm a little bit of a glutton. So if we're going to be doing cheat meals, I need to have strategies in place to, uh, anticipate those tendencies to prophylactically mitigate my, I don't know, innate desire to overconsume. And yeah, you can like work on that um, your, yourself, but it's nice if you can work on it with a coach too. It's nice if your coach can offer some insight and at least keep that part of the conversation, um, I guess, open for correction and expansion. I, I wish, I wish I had had a coach like that at any point during my career. Cause I think, I think that would have been helpful. I just kind of uh, self coached myself to realize like, Hey bitch, like you are, you're the drama, you're the problem. Let's uh, approach these untracked meals a little more conservatively because I think this is the issue. I think this is the pattern that is happening. And I mean, some of y'all might be like, well, that's super disordered, but now I, I just prefer not to do cheat meals. And if I do want to go out to a meal, I truly do chalk it up to like that meal is not tracked, but that it was planned. It was anticipated. Yes, for the most part, but I'm also, I, I try not to lie to myself and be like, oh yeah, like I can estimate the calories. I'm like, no, uh, there's a very good chance that that, that part of my week, um, took away from some of my deficit and in order to combat that maybe there is an adjustment the following day depending on the context of the meal uh, depending on what phase I'm in if I'm growing like maybe not maybe I can get away with being slightly over more so that day than another day but I think when it comes to uh, making those decision decisions for yourself developing that autonomy that skill of dieting it all starts with your belief that you are in control of the strategy that you take. Now, it's not to get confused and say like, oh, like give your client or give yourself so many options. Too many options is overwhelming. Don't do that. That is especially for type A, like you anxious. Okay, don't give them so many options that it just becomes uh, very cluttered. Give them one or two best options. If you need to list out like pros and cons of each one, cool. Uh, but having the ability to make a decision and feel confident about your decision, that I think really builds self-efficacy uh, in an individual, in yourself. And I think that starts with the belief that you do have a choice in what you're going to do. That it's not black and white it's not chicken fucking broccoli fucking rice like it is not it doesn't have to be that way and that that is a big like that was the thing when I got into this uh sport when I got into bodybuilding in 2014 I, I was I was so disordered then like I mean with I, I tracked macros before then but I, I was like anytime I was like not in control of my food or like there was a social event. It just stressed me out because I felt like, okay, control of my food, losing weight, getting leaner. 
not control of my food getting fatter and I didn't have the context. I didn't have the, the tools, uh, the understanding, the education, or the self-belief that I could make choices. I could make choices quickly and I can make the right choices. And even though that took a long time to develop, I do, I do strongly believe that developing that skill of dieting, that skill of making decisions around food that ultimately are going to have an impact on your body composition, the better you get at that, the less anxiety you're going to have around social events, the less anxiety you're going to have around vacations, uh, the more confident and better you're going to feel about like, yeah, okay, like I'm going to do my best. But at this point, like, I know I know it's a guesstimation and if I'm over, well, then I'll gain body fat. But hey, that self-belief, it goes both ways. Gain a little body fat because I was a little over on food. Guess what? I understand how to do this. I'll pull the calories back down. I'll lose the weight. Easy. It is a light lift. It is not hard. And ultimately, that's what I want to inspire people to do. It's what I want to inspire people to foster that skill, that confidence in their in themselves to feel like they have control over their body composition. Yes, it takes work. No, it does not have to be this hyper focused or hyper restrictive uh, approach or, or means of dieting. It does require sacrifice. It does require delayed gratification. But the better and, and more efficient you are, at at doing so, uh, the easier the results will come, assuming the program you're following is conducive with that. I think if you, you want to see someone change, uh, coaching as well as not coaching, it has to be their choice. I think if you want something to land and you want it to be something that is repeatable, the individual must see the buy-in. And if they don't, well, sure, they can do it out of obedience. But the minute that they don't have to do it, the minute you're not like hounding them or, you know, looking over their shoulder, they're going to deviate. And, and they might even deviate just out of resentment, just out of like, yeah, I don't, I'm tired of fucking doing it your way. Like, this sucks. And I, I think people develop that tendency it's now a bad habit they the substitute that in because they're kind of like well i don't like following the strategy that gets me these results so i'm going to do it until i can't do it i'll break and then i'll get back on the wagon it's like wouldn't like how efficient is this is this is this really like worth it like is it really worth it when you know that there's a better way so Big, big things. Food, intake, cardio, output. Intake, output, seco. Calories in, calories out. Um, that ultimately controls everything that is happening with your body composition. You're losing weight. By definition, you are in a deficit. Weight is not being lost nor gained. You are at relative maintenance. Relative maintenance is not a single day. Relative maintenance is like your whole week. Think of it like a budget, you know, like you're constantly shits being pulled out of your account. It's getting auto drafted. You're spending stuff. Um, you're having to pay with cash. Some places you go, okay, like you're depleting that fund too. Cool. You're also making money. Maybe you have multiple streams of income. Patreon's lighting up. Uh, Spotify, you know, okay, some a little little tiny bit of money there. Maybe from Facebook. Also getting paid salary um, wherever you work. Maybe you're making some side income as well. Okay, so. What is the net at the end of the week? Positive or negative? Are you in a surplus or a deficit? You're gaining weight. You're in a surplus. You are not gaining weight in a deficit. And that's where these variables are so important to track. What are these variables that dictate or that affect, that artificially inflate the scale weight? Well, the big one, water. Now, water... That is going to be driven partially through the macromolecules you consume. For every one gram of carb you consume, you're going to find that it's like three to four grams of water. Well, there's like 450, 460 grams of water in a pound. Or 400, sorry. 460 grams of fluid 
comes out to about a pound in, in scale weight and mass. Um, I think I'm saying that right. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I did this, I did this with Tate not too long ago where we're like, she was, she was a little nervous about her weight and I'm like, listen, we've increased carbs X amount. I'm telling you like overnight, this will immediately result in X number of pounds increased on the scale. Cause it was, it was so many, she was eating so much food. And when I laid it out like that, I'm like, here's the math. Here's my case for you thoughts. She's like, makes total sense. It actually checks out very accurately when you consider that. Now, what other things affect water? Well, sodium. Increase your sodium intake, you're going to hold on to more water. So now we've got the increase in carbs as well as the increase in sodium. Okay, that's another one. Uh, GI weight. You ever go from like cream of wheat, cream of rice, like something just very low volume, easy to digest to like monster salad bowls? Or like just like something very heavy, something that sits for a long time with you, like the actual weight in your GI tract, in your small and large intestine, like, oh, and also you didn't poop. Okay. Another one, another thing that we have to consider. So all of these things I like to look at on a weekly basis because I'm trying to build a picture. I'm trying to look at like, okay, here are the obvious things that fuck up the accuracy of your scale weight. Let's create this pile over here everyone we're going to go through okay water sleep yeah sleep is another one sleep oh you, you got four hours of sleep like me okay uh scale weight's not going to be accurate and some of these some of these days i don't even take my scale weight when i know i'm like yeah I don't, I, I don't need to see it i do not need to see that today if i if i know i'm very sensitive to it which is is not like necessarily the best habit i would still i would still take it because like what does it matter but also note hey scale weight is likely artificially inflated on account of X, Y, and Z. And then you put in your notes, here are the variables that contributed to this. Here's the fluctuation. And now you've established a new trend entirely. Here is the pattern of artificially inflated weigh-ins that occur when I get four hours of sleep. Amazing. Another data point that is actually pretty, pretty consistent. Like Patrick, uh, he would take, he's so good about taking his weight. He would um, take it even on like work days. And I don't think he would use the bathroom before. He would just first thing in the morning take it. So it would be up like four pounds. He would usually get so, uh, so much less sleep before those weigh-ins. And he would be getting up at like five. So then he'd take it. Okay, cool. And he would know, he would know the next day, um, he would always weigh in like two, three, maybe four pounds lighter after a full day's rest. And this would happen like if he worked three days in a row. Okay, those are three back-to-back days where maybe over that increase, like they're continuing to go up um, or holding. Rest, water, sleep, sodium, carbs, uh, hormones, menstrual cycle. This isn't one of those things you got to get overly nuanced with. But you do have to respect the fact, respect the period, respect ovulation. Ovulation is going to come with undulation of these hormones. That's okay. We can expect that. You can trend this too, which I strongly recommend. And then you can know like, hey, days 20 through, uh, 20 through, 22 through 29, you know, you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to be seeing some higher weigh-ins, even if I look leaner. Even if I look softer, I'm going to be seeing higher weigh-ins. And guess what? After ovulation, the weight should drop off at a greater, like the drop-off should be greater than anticipated if it was a normal week. That I find to be very consistent. So wrapping up here, establish the buy-in, whether it's for yourself, for your clients. Uh, Don't underestimate the calories and the grade school math that comes with mapping out these cheat meals, these untracked meals, and take into account factors that can artificially inflate your scale weight when making decisions around how hard you want to go with these um, untracked meals and, and even how deep you want to go in your deficits. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. As always, let me know in the comments below. If you're listening on like Spotify or YouTube, let me know in the comments. Let me know if you like it, you hate it. Does it sound okay? Um, and then 
I don't know. I know on Spotify, I put like a little poll up. Go ahead. Answer that too. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed. As always, I will see you in the next one.